ages. Not long enough, <laughs> some people might say. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, my, uh, our, mine and Mary's last three or four weeks have been pretty intense processing, so, um, and we're feeling quite a bit different, actually, than what we were three or four weeks ago. And uh, so that's a good thing. It's always a good thing when you feel different, isn't it? And uh, my, my primary issues that I've been working my way through have a lot to do with my fears about some big picture things in terms of uh, the spirits who are looking after and running our world's economic system. So, um, and I've forgotten to turn on our MP3, so that's... Now that's going, that's good. So, um, so my emotions have been dealing with quite a bit of uh, fear about uh, what might happen to myself, my good person, in the future with regard to confrontations with, um, that, I, that I can feel our spirit, some of our spirit friends, which you may not call them friends, but I still do, are trying to organise for my future. So we'll just see what happens there. And so I've been uh, working my way through a lot of fears about uh, what could happen in the future with regard to myself. And uh, Mary's been working through a lot of first century emotions towards myself as well with regard to the reason why it's been difficult for her to connect with me. So that's been really good. So our relationship's changing quite a lot over the last few weeks. And what we'll be doing in this session actually is discussing with you some of the, em in the emotions that go on inside of a relationship and how to deal with these emotions from a divine love perspective rather than from a natural love perspective. So today's session is human relationships and it's the second, second one of the se session two of the relationships with a partner. Now remember the last time we did a uh, human relationship session with regard to relationship with a partner, I said these are all the principles of natural love. And then I said we were going to discuss at some point in the future all of the principles of divine love in a relationship with a partner. Well, that's today's session and tomorrow, by the way. What, what happened was as I was typing away, merrily coming up with all these different things to discuss with you today, um, we started realising that it was going to take more than one day to discuss them. And so that's why we turned it into a session where t today and tomorrow. Now what we'd like to do today is uh, present the information to you, but feel free today to ask questions on the topic. But if you can make sure the questions are on the topic, and if they're not on the topic, I'll probably say, no, that's off topic, so let's move on with the topic, if that's okay with you. Tomorrow uh, we would like to focus, and today and tomorrow, if we can focus on the questions regarding relationships. And if you feel free to share your, the, the issues that you're facing in your relationship, feel free to do that and you can come up into the hot seat and, uh, and hopefully at some point share what's going on and then we'll talk about some of the underlying emotions and how to deal with those underlying emotions from a perspective of not harming yourself or not harming your partner but still working your way through the emotions. So that's what we'd like to do um, today and tomorrow. Next week, I just wanted to remind you that we're having an introductory uh, session, the Secrets to the Universe session down at the Gold Coast. Um, the venue has 350 seats, so we can invite friends or wh whoever you feel game enough to invite. Um, I'm going to be relatively confrontational in the discussion, so, so we'll see what happens uh, next week in, in that. And then the Sunday will be in the same venue and we'll be answering people's questions that they've had from the Saturday. So on the Saturday what we're going to do is have some questions but not lots of them and then on Sunday hopefully we can answer lots of questions uh, that come up overnight for people who have listened to the Saturday's session. So that's our, our presentation next week. Matt, and um, we need a microphone. So. There's only one microphone today because the other one seems to keep buzzing all the time and so uh, we just need to be patient. I 
just wonder what sort of response you've had for the for next week, for next Saturday. Um, I've got no idea. <laughs> I don't keep tabs of those kind of things. Uh, what we do is, with all of our sessions, is we just tell everybody that it's on, and whoever rocks up, rocks up, basically. And I don't keep tabs of who rocks up and who doesn't, and and so forth. So, um, for that reason, I've got no idea how many people are coming at this point, and. If it turns out there's more than 350, well, I suppose <laughs> we've made a mistake on the side of the venue. Um, but uh, that's generally the case. Something I wanted to discuss with you before we begin today's session is I am thinking quite seriously in the future of not saying what the topics are in advance. Um, the reason why is that quite often I'm, I'm there typing up a topic and now I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know whether we should be doing this topic this weekend. I feel, you know, based on what I can feel from everyone's emotions, we perhaps should be dealing with this particular topic. And the problem is, is that some people have made long journeys, and I think there's some here from, uh, there's a few from overseas here today, by the way. Um, someone from Zimbabwe is here, is that right? Yeah? You want to put your hand up? You live here now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well then, then you're local. <laughs> Mike is from England. Um, I met uh, Mike two years ago. And so, welcome, welcome Mike. Um, sorry? You're from Germany. Awesome. What was your name? Basanti. Basanti. Yep, lovely to meet you too. And so, welcome to those overseas visitors. And I know that quite a lot of you do travel some distance um, you know, quite a few hundred to up to like seven or eight hundred kilometres to come along to these events. And, and one thing I would like to ask those of you who do is, are you going to be stressed out not knowing what the topic is? Um, so, uh, okay, so um, the beauty of me doing that is that is the law of attraction then works perfectly. See, at the moment, the law of attraction is not really working perfectly because we already know what's being discussed and then we make a decision in our minds, right? And usually what happens is we finish up making the decision in our mind that's not even in harmony with what we feel. And the problem with that is that oftentimes we don't go to a session that could have the biggest impact on us and then we choose to go to a session that has a, quite a, a, a small impact on us. And so uh, what I would like to do is allow the law of attraction to work in a far more seamless manner for you. And so in the future, we're thinking of not having any indication of what the topic will be. Now, there's only two times that I'll probably break that rule. One is when we do a question and answer session. So I'll usually let you know when we do a question and answer session. So that way it gives you the opportunity to come along with heaps of different questions. Um, and, and ask them. The second one is when we do the mediumship and healing sessions because obviously that's a step-by-step -step thing that we're going through for those of you who are attending that and so I do I will probably let you know what day of course that is occurring on so um, and but not necessarily what the next topic is going to be until the session itself. I will still in many cases uh, still produce an outline like you've been getting and in some cases, that outline will be available before the event. So if you, and, it, and in future, I'm thinking of not emailing out large groups of emails. At the moment, there's quite a few, it's near, uh, quite a few um, people on the email list. And most of the providers nowadays have limits of sending out 500 emails at a, to 500 addresses at a time and they have all sorts of spam requirements regarding that. And then I've noticed in the last send out that I just did that Hotmail actually blocked my ISP provider and so that, what that meant was that none of you who have got Hotmail addresses actually received the information. And so um, it's probably better from now on that we actually just place the information on the website and then you can go to it uh, at any time. What we'll also do then is place a schedule of where we'll be on the website. And if it's not on the website, then I'd, I don't know where I'll be. <laughs> and if it's on the website, that's what it, it will be for the moment. So there's also uh, some things that have, we're looking at in terms of venues um, and, and 
the Patellas have offered a venue to us uh, up in Butterham uh, that we'll be checking out on Monday and will possibly be uh, the next session that we have around the, in the Sunshine Coast. And it's a much larger venue. It seats around 300 or so, by the, or even perhaps more. Um, and uh, it sounds like it's in a beautiful garden as well. So, um, so we may finish up uh, having a different venue too in the Sunshine Coast, which means that more people can come and enjoy the seminar in comfort rather than having to sit up outside <coughs> in a garden and maybe get eaten by mosquitoes and so forth in the process. So. Um, so that's the changes that will be happening over the coming months. Um, then myself and Mary are considering a few trips uh, away. Uh, a group of people um, in, in Las Vegas have offers, offered to pay for a trip for us to go there to speak with them. And so we may actually having, be having a trip overseas sometime. It'll, looking at this point like it'll probably be around March or so. And uh, we're also considering going to New Zealand because there's a group of people there who want to uh, hear the truth and talk and have questions. And so it looks like we might be going there in around January. So that's the things that will be happening in the future, just to give you a bit of an update. All right. How's your relationships going? <laughs> it's interesting on the Divine Love Path, isn't it? You can, you can see why a lot of people avoid... Uh, processing their emotions in a relationship. Right? Because when it gets to focusing on the emotion rather than on the intellect of the whole process, you finish up having all these different types of emotions rise up. So you might have anger rise up or sadness rise up. Now sadness is not so bad because normally when you're sad you're just having a cry. And, you know, the people around you um, usually only start reacting when the cry lasts for any longer than five minutes. And then, and then they start reacting and trying to shut you down, right? And, and so when you cry for an hour, now everyone's really worried. And if you're a mum or something, now they're really worried because it's like no dinner's coming and all these other things happen. <laughs> and before you know it, it's like this terrible uh, projection's coming at you just to shut up and get <laughs> back to your normal way of life, right? And that's a, that's a terrible thing about... Uh, the way the world is governed at the moment, isn't it? Because at the moment, there's very little allowance of our emotional work. So we're all carrying around all of these blockages, you know, these blockages, these methods of suppression that keep your emotions from actually bubbling out. But the problem is when you start on the divine love path, you know, and you go through that initial love phase of the divine love path, you know, where you really feel good about it and isn't this wonderful and all these truths start hitting you. And then... Once you get past that, which, you know, should we call that the honeymoon period? <laughs> yeah. Once you get past this honeymoon period, what happens after then? Well, after then, the emotions start coming up, right? And before you know it, like, you're in these terrible emotions, and some of them last, like, an hour or two or even a day or two. And some even, like, you know, if you don't get to the core of them, might last a week or two or longer. And, and everyone around you is feeling the effects of this as well, of course, aside from yourself, of course, feeling the effects of it too. And in a relationship, what eventually finishes up happening is we start acting out these codependencies or these addictions. You could call them, and I prefer to call them addictions, where we want from somebody else something, so we want an emotion from them to be given to us, and if they don't give us that emotion anymore, then we have a reaction to that, whatever that reaction is. And then we also have emotions we feel we must give them in order to make a happy relationship work. And of course, then it becomes a bartering system of addiction, really. And, you know, the technical term is codependency that they use, you know, in psychological term, ter terms. But in reality, what it is, is each partner acting out their addiction with the other partner. So we're in this relationship, well, I'm acting out my addictions with Mary, Mary's acting out her addictions with me, and then one of us has a realisation. Right? It might be, wow, like, I'm allowing, I'm allowing something here that just doesn't feel right to me anymore. And then we go through the emotion of it. So we connect with some childhood emotion, process that, about that, you know, related to my dad or my mother, in most cases these emotions are. And I process this emotion 
And then what happens? I'm changed. And I no longer have a certain addiction now that is related to that emotion. Now, what do you think my partner is going to do with that? Now, if the partner has become addicted to my addiction, in other words, if my partner has been so dependent on this addiction as being part of our, our relationship, what's going to happen? They are going to have a reaction. And, you know, one of their reactions might be anger and a big blow up and, and then, oh, this is so unfair, isn't it? Don't you find it so unfair when someone's angry with you? Like, and so what do you do when someone's angry with you? Like, if you can't walk away, and often in a partnership we don't think we can walk away, so what do we finish up doing oftentimes? Just get angry back. You know? And then it becomes another set of addictions that we're acting out, really, of how to control each other to get back what we, want it, that we, what we think we want. Now, on the natural love path, the way we would deal with all of that is we'd, you know, we think, oh, I'm angry with my partner, so off we go into our room, lay down and do the Zen thing, you know, the, the meditation thing and get myself back into this lovely, clear state. Now I feel good about my partner again. Isn't that wonderful? Now, of course, the emotion still is there within me and now every time they trigger the emotion, I'm going to have to go in my room and do the same thing, right? Which often, you know, in the short term, that might sound attractive because it works pretty well, right? But in the long term, it's just like effort after... And, and we give up doing that in the end, don't we? And then we start doing things like tuning out of the relationship, where we tune out of the sexual part of the relationship or we tune out of the emotional part of the relationship. And when we start tuning out of the relationship, now we can feel the barriers between each other. Do you feel that sometimes? Like, you can feel the barrier. And if you're sensitive emotionally, you can actually feel each barrier of what's going on between yourself and your partner throughout a day. And sometimes it can be 10, 20, 30 times a day your relationship will change quite markedly. So the question becomes with all of that, how do I deal with all that? How do I deal with all that and still stay on the divine love path and still stay feeling my emotions and still stay connected with God and yet still deal with this thing that's going on between myself and my partner? still be able to deal with my addictions. And that's what we'd like to talk about a lot today. What are the different things that we can do to avoid the process of getting flared up in terms of with each other in an adult way? So you remember, for all of us, we all have causal, usually we have causal childhood anger to process. Right? So you can think of it this way. Here's an event that happened when I was, a, I was young. Maybe two, three, four years of age, doesn't really matter. It might even be pre-birth. It might be in the time during conception and birth, right? An event occurred. It created an emotion in me, right? Now, if that emotion in me was shut down by my environment, and usually it is, you know, not many parents allow their child, for example, even to cry fully. So, you know, like a, cry, a child may go outside, you know, have an accident and comes coming in crying to mum and what's the first thing we tend to do? Pick up the child and we go, oh, there, there, you don't need to cry, it's okay now. Do you know what I mean? What's the message straight away is, I've got to calm, you know, stop this crying thing. And, and then after a while the child's still crying, you know, some of us even go into a state of, I'll give you something to cry about if you don't stop crying now. Right? <laughs> we? That's what we do. And so the emotion gets shut down. So the experience is now, the energy that should be in motion has now been frozen inside of us, right? At that moment. Then the environment just places around us, and the environment includes our parents, but it also includes, if we're going to school, the school environment includes our friends and their families and their parents and all sorts of things construct our environment. And our environment has this deep level of suppression of emotion going on. Now, many of us on the Divine Love Path know this now because when we're on the path feeling our emotions, you can, you can feel that projection coming from people around you to shut you down constantly. So we have this level of denial, right, that goes on above, above these emotions that are now all locked up inside of me. 
Now, when I start on the Divine Love Path, what I'm doing is I'm firstly going through the process of removing my denial of my emotions. In other words, I'm starting to say, instead of me being an intellectual being, I am an emotional being. And if I focus on being an emotional being, that means being real. I need to be real with the emotions I truly feel inside of myself. Instead of thinking that I feel something when I don't really feel it. So I start going into a state of starting to feel my emotions. That means these emotions start coming out of me in all sorts of ways, don't they? Right? They come out of you in all sorts of ways. Now, usually what happens is there's a, because of the denial of the childhood emotion, the child has all this frustration and anger and rage, firstly, to deal with. Right? And you see it sometimes in little children quite easily. You take a little child into a supermarket, past the lolly aisle, and refuse it to get one. Uh -huh. You deny it, expressing its desire to get a lolly. Quite often, you'll have a screaming child on the floor, you know, yelling and screaming in a tantrum. Now, that is its childhood emotion that that has suppressed deeper underlying emotions that it hasn't yet felt. Right in that instant, it's expressing it. These are the types of emotions that many of us, by the time we're adult, we've never expressed. And, you know, and so now we need to start expressing them. So we start expressing this anger and rage. But, but the problem is, we have this tendency when we come to anger and rage of blaming the person that's right in front of us for it. And in a partnership, who's the person right in front of you? Most of the time is your partner, whoever that may be. And so your partner gets a barrage of actual emotion that really comes from the unexpressed rage or unexpressed anger in your childhood. Uh, it would be much better if you can connect to the unexpressed childhood emotion of rage or anger than it would be to express as an adult. So we've got to talk about anger and what that is doing as a part of this discussion. And then what happens is once, so you could say that the denial that we wrote in here has created a whole range of childhood anger. Now remember this is, this is childhood, not adult anger. And a child experiences anger in a very, very different way generally than an adult, particularly if it's allowed to express it uh, from a very early age, you'll notice that it actually does the tantrum type thing. Where it will just lay on the ground with arms flailing and screaming its head off, right? Screaming and yelling and, and like just having a tantrum. And to be frank, in your emotional processing work, you're going to have plenty of times when you have a tantrum. Right? If you connect to this emotion, which is capping many of our childhood core emotions. But what happens is we then get that suppressed. Right? Our parents generally, again, suppress this type of anger. And so we have another level of denial above the suppression of this childhood anger. And that's what creates the adult stuff. The adult anger, the adult rage, the adult resentment, and so forth. So can you see it's like layers, and this is, you know, I've talked about this quite often, there's layer upon layer upon layer, like peeling away an onion. Right, layers of different emotions. Now, can you see that if I don't allow this, then how am I going to get to this? And if I don't allow that, then I'm not going to get to that. Does that make sense? Like, that's the way we work. We have this layer upon layer of denial, and if we step down into it, we will get to the underlying causal emotion. But the problem is, the very first time we, you could think of it like a bottle, right? You got the bottle, and the very first time, you imagine it's a bottle of like champagne. You pop the cork, and what generally happens the first time you pop the cork? Whoosh, everything just goes everywhere, right? Including the cork. And, and you're just, and all of a sudden, then it starts dying down, and then you can basically tip it out at will. But initially, on the Divine Love Path, what many people experience when they start popping the cork, if you like, of their emotions, is they feel quite uncontrolled. And what we want to do is actually address those issues too. Address the issues of why, what we feel inside of ourselves when we start to connecting to the emotion. Now, in our first presentation about, uh, about the, the issue of relationships, 
we asked a few questions. The first question that we asked was, what, this was the questions that, what does love do? Remember we asked that? And we were focused then on natural love. In other words, if I loved another person, what would I do? Now, the problem is, we are so distorted with love that most of the time we, we think something's loving when it's not. And today what I'm going to do is illustrate to you a lot of those things that we think are loving that actually aren't loving. And we'll look at some of the divine laws involved with love and then try to apply that to our relationship. So that's what we la answered last time. What does love do? And then in amongst that, remember we answered we answer this question as well. What does desire do? Now that was sort of like a supplementary question. And the reason why it's a supplementary question is quite often we ask ourselves, what does love do? And we've got no idea. And, and so we think love does this. Like, oh, love sacrifices myself. I sacrifice myself when I'm loving. But, but when we ask the question, what does desire do? Well, if you have a desire. If you're sacrificing your own desire, are you being loving to yourself? No. So is that love then to the other person? No. Can you see? That that's why we ask those questions. So in the previous session, we asked those questions. But the third set of questions that we really need to ask, and these, I believe, are the most important. What does God's love do? You could even go one step further and just ask, what does God do? Uh -huh. I feel f for myself and my own progression that that has been the most single most important question to ask. Now, for many of us, we don't have very, we have a pretty loose view of God, right? Most of us. If a view at all. Like, so we might feel that just God is an energy or God is love or, and some of those things I'll be addressing next week in the introductory session that we do. But the truth is that God is an entity who has an emotion of love to give to all of us. And so then the question becomes is, if I'm on the divine love path of spiritual progression and I'm in a relationship, which means I'm in a love relationship with another person, what would, if I'm receiving divine love or if I want to be in harmony of receiving divine love in my relationship, what would I do if I want to become at one with God? I've got to eventually become at one with what God's love does. In other words, I've got to learn about it some, somehow, learn about what God's love would do in this relationship and do that. And I don't mean learning it here. Because remember, we can't even receive divine love if we try to do it all here. Right? This is about learning it and doing it here in your heart, what you call your figurative heart. Your feelings and your emotions and your desires and passions, changing those. That's what it's really about. So the question, what does God's love do, now has to refer to my soul, has to refer to how I feel inside of me and has to be honest about how I'm feeling. So let's say we have an issue with our partner. You know, we feel usually, the first emotion we feel in a relationship with our partner generally is an emotion of anger, is it not? Like, you, you, you know, you drive along a car, you know, the lovely lady is giving you the directions. Right? So you're driving along. <laughs> right? And is it that road there? No, no. Go past that road. Yes, sorry, it's that road. Right? And what's the feeling? What's the feeling? Right? There's this feeling that rises right, at that moment. And, and the majority of us have a tendency to dismiss these day-to-day -day and moment-by-moment -moment feelings. So another type of situation might be, you know, we're laying there in bed, and you're feeling a bit sexy, right? So you roll over and you might touch your wife or uh, opposite your partner and you, f and you can feel their coldness, right? No, I'm not interested. And what do you feel then? Feeling of rejection and so forth. But then you just tell yourself, oh no, well, she's tired, that's fine, you know, it's been a hard day, and go off to sleep, right? So you don't process any emotion. But often we feel these emotions from a moment-by-moment -moment basis throughout a day in a relationship. 
So what we want to do is start asking ourselves, instead of what do I do, well most of us tend to ignore these emotions, right? What would God's love do in this situation? That's the question we need to start asking ourselves. And I need to ask, what would God's love do? So if I was reflecting divine love in my relationship with my partner, what would God's love do towards myself? So how does God feel about me in this situation is one question. The second question is how does God feel about my partner in this situation? And of course, if my partner is on the divine love path, then she would be asking the same things, the same questions, right? How does, my, how does God's love treat my partner? How does God's love treat me? Now, do you feel God sacrifices love for a person but different to another person in preference to another person? No, obviously. God would be impartial, would she not? So if she's impartial in her love, that means she loves you and she loves your partner exactly the same. Right? Both of you are loved by God exactly the same. So even when your partner cheats on you, she's still loved by God exactly the same as she did just before she cheated on you. Right? Now I bet you don't do that <laughs> in that moment, right? Why? Because we have all these emotions rise within us, right? Let's say we've been working hard at work and uh, we come home, you know, this very traditional, I'll give you a very traditional sort of view here. We work, come home and our wife's been, uh, you know, doing her nails all day and having pedicure, manicure and all the other things, you know, during the day out with her friends. She comes, she's not even there. She's not even home. And you walk in the door, it's all dark, you know, nobody's home and you're hungry. And what is the emotion that often rises in you at that particular point? Or if you're the wife, you've been nagging your husband for four weeks now to fix the tap in the bathroom, right? And it's just like never happening. It's just not happening. And so you ring up the plumber, you know, and he comes in and fixes up the tap in the bathroom, right? And then husband comes home and says, what did you do? You spent 80 bucks on a plumber. You know, and then before you know it, you're in an argument justifying each other's position because what's going on in each case is we're not really connected with, at the soul level, of what God's love would do with each other in that situation. Does that make sense? Now, in a natural love situation, in all those things I mentioned, we will often use zone-out techniques or reframing the whole thing in our mind. Do you know what I mean by that? when you reframe the whole thing in your mind, you tell yourself how you feel by telling yourself a story. We are masters at this. We're masters at this because our parents were masters at this, right? And they taught us how to be masters at this by the time we were five, right? So, and then we've just got this whole life of where we've mastered this beautiful method of getting away from emotions. So what do we do in that situation? The woman tells herself, you didn't do something for four weeks. You didn't care about me. You know, I'm asking you to do this and you didn't do that. And the man's saying, but I've been busy and when I come home I don't want to have to work. And, you know, there are all these different emotions going on. And then we start telling ourselves stories. The story is, oh yeah, I, she did ask for four weeks, you know, and I didn't do it. And so, you know, I can understand probably why she rang up the plumber. Do you know what I mean? And she might be saying, yeah, I can understand, you know, he, he, he does work hard and whatever, and yeah, that's true, he does. Um, so I don't really need to be this angry with him because, you know, he works hard, he's worked hard the last four weeks in particular, and he hasn't really had much time to do that. Yeah, so, you know, so, yeah, I was right to call the plumber, but I, we might feel in the end, and, but, but I'm not right to be angry with him. And you know what we just did, both of us? We just did the natural love thing. And the natural love thing is getting into a nice, calm state again without dealing with the underlying causal emotional reason as to why the other state happened. Do you see what I mean? The other state, you know the angry state that come up. We're not dealing with the reason why that happened. 
the underlying emotional reason. Now, for the example I gave, the wife's emotional reason might be that when her husband doesn't do something she asks, she doesn't feel loved. And that connected her to the fact that she's getting ignored by her father when she was a child and hardly had any contact with him when she was a child. And she doesn't deal with that emotion. Now, his emotion might be that, you know, he comes home from work, comes home from work, he feels unappreciated. And when he goes back to his childhood, his mother basically felt like, you know, any man, you know, is a problem, pretty much. And so she, he had this, he lived with this emotion of being unappreciated as a male all of his life, and he doesn't want to deal with that emotion. Can you see? Like, and all we did in the whole example, all we did was deny what was going on both of us. And what I'm suggesting to you is we've got to stop doing that. Because if we keep doing that, we are just getting ourselves out of the causal emotions that prevent our relationship with God. So that's what I'm suggesting, to stop doing that. How's everyone feeling at the moment? Pretty bored? <laughs> uh, question? So if we can have a mic first and then a mic up with Joy. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to say that the uh, first time I met you, I thought, uh, I thought I know you. That was pretty, pretty strong within me. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, now I, I see you. I, I saw, I've seen you on the DVDs. Yeah. And now I see you here in life. And uh, I, it's still, I have that feeling. I know you seems very long, yep. <clears throat> every expression you do, every movement you do, every movement you do, what you say, I know that all. Yeah. So, also about the emotions and dealing with emotions because I'm coming from a path where we basically deal with emotions. Yep. So, I'd just like to share that and uh, when you say you need to stop it, like if you say, stop it, I think it's quite a huge process to be, I mean, first to become aware yep. that, that you can't really stop it in the moment yep. because you're so used to, to live it, yep. not, not live your emotions. So I think it's quite long, I mean, quite an intense process for people who have never done any emotional work. Yep. I mean, I, I like to share that because I, I, I come from my past where we basically were working on emotions. And yep. Emotions, emotions. So yep. that, uh, but you are right. It, it is, uh, it is hard to get out of the yeah, process of, so of not dealing with emotions and yeah. into dealing with emotions. And it's very beautiful. I mean, I think it's very important to get support also from people around you. Well, see, that's where I'd have to disagree with you. Yeah? Yeah, because, you know... Oftentimes what we're doing when we're going for support... I mean support to stay in your emotion. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I understand. But just maybe push a bit I understand all of that. I understand what you're saying. Don't, I, I completely understand what you're saying. But the problem is a lot of times when we're going for support from others, for either support, either support to deny or support to feel, either one, is we're now basing our own progression on what another person does to us. And as soon as we do that, we're skipping over a whole group of emotions that we still need to actually process that are going to interfere with our relationship with God. You see, in the end, what's going to happen for yourself is that you will have this relationship with God where no one else around you, you don't need anyone else around you to help you with your emotions. You will actually have all of your emotions because you have the biggest possible helper, your creator, helping you already. Right? Now, often what we do, though, is we are distancing ourselves from our relationship with God by trying to interact with others with our emotions. And this is what we do often in our partnership as well. We want them to do something for us. We want to do something for them. When we have our friends come around, we do things for them and they do things for us. And what we're often doing is avoiding the deep feelings inside of ourselves that we still need to work through with God. So. What I've found in my own progression is that the times when I've often done the most work has been when I've been completely alone 
and not had a single piece of support from any single person around me. So don't avoid dealing with your emotion just because you feel you don't have support. Because the, tr the truth is you do. And I know you're not saying that, but what, I'm, what, I, what I am saying is you do not need to have an open, supportive environment before you deal with your emotion. And if you feel you do, then there's an injury to work through emotionally about that. Does that make sense? But that's a bit off topic, so if we can get back to our topic. Joy, you had a question? Oh, wait. You'll wait. Uh, wait for the mic. Yep. Otherwise, we don't hear it on the tapes. Hello, yep. I'm Barbara. How are you, Barbara? One thing. Going back to um, you talking about the layers yep. and children um, uh, performing tantrums and things like that, mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't quite sure whether you meant if they, if they, if if you didn't allow them to perform the tantrums, that they weren't. Um, unleashing those um, emotions or I have another concern because I had a child who who explained no signs of that whatsoever so did yep. that child not have emotions to express or he was living my dream my story of being a master at suppressing emotions yeah yeah you remember from our parenting children discussion which is separate discussion um, that every child is reflecting the parent's denied emotion. So every single situation is going to be different depending upon what the parent is actually suppressing in their life. So you can't make a blanket statement about every single situation with regard to children and their expression of emotions. What I was getting to about with the, with the flailing, you know, tantrum thing, is that many of us have this big rage and anger from our childhood inside of us right now and we've never been allowed to connect to it when we're a child now I've been with some people in the past where where I've suggested they just let the child connect to the tantrum right and sometimes the child's connected with the tantrum for two hours like just being in a uh, Mike, Mike was in one of these situations with one of the, a, ch a child he knows um, and what happened was that we were in this situation, the child was buckled into the car, doing a tantrum for two hours, screaming, yelling. There were six, six people in the car and uh, everyone had to put up with this screaming and yelling for two hours. We were driving from Miami north up in, in the US. And, and I suggest everyone just to feel their own emotions as to why they wanted to shut the child down, right? And so nobody in the car tried to shut the child down. Right? Now after two hours, what happened was the child got through this big childhood suppression of a deeper emotion and went into grief. And then for the next 20 minutes, just sobbed his little heart out. Just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried for 20 minutes. So the, the actual causal emotion was a lot shorter than the denial of the emotion. In the denial, it was amazing to see the techniques the child, three years old, had already learnt by its interaction with its, par with its parents, um, what the child had already learnt to suppress its emotions. So he went through this emotion with his mum of screaming at her. And then he went through this emotion of crying at her but not really feeling the tears, you know, feeling the grief, just crying at her to try to get him to respond to it, her to respond to his tears. And then he told her she was a bad mum and he hated her. And that went on for 10 or 15 minutes, like, I hate you, I hate you, mum. Like, you know, and that, you know, normally she'd respond to that emotion. And he, and he just went through that. And so mum, of course, through all of this is feeling her stuff as well, right? And then he went into this state of throwing things around, like just like, so we got, you know, cars and everything coming from the back of the, <laughs> up to the front, you know, and a bit of food and everything else. And that, that, that went on for a little while. And then, and then there, there was this whole thing, he, he turned to me because he, he knew that I was the person sort of uh, saying that this should happen, right? And he was saying to me, I hate you, I hate you, get out of my car. And he was just, so, <laughs> so he was into me then, like, and, uh, and I said, that's all right, Luca, you can hate me, you know. 
And then he would get more angry and off he would go again. And so, so there was just this cycle of all these learned techniques that he had by three years of age that caused, that he learnt through his interaction with everyone around him to, to not get to the underlying emotion itself, which was grief. He felt unloved by his mother, from his mother and he didn't want to feel that emotion. And he went through huge amounts of stuff to not feel that emotion. When he connected to that emotion, he just sobbed his little heart out. And you can feel the change in a person when they are in this top level capping stuff and they drop into the real emotion. Now when, they, when he dropped into the real emotion, he sobbed for 15 or 20 minutes, that was it. It was done. And then he said, mummy, he, he, he didn't yell at her anymore, he didn't scream at, it, didn't scream at us anymore. You could actually feel that he, that he was not stressed out about any of us in the car. And in fact, he wasn't even angry with me anymore about the whole thing. He just said to mummy, could I, could we stop the, he said, could, what, could I have a hug now? Right. So he pulled over the car, mum got out, gave him a big hug, and I got out and, and uh, got, bought him some strawberries <laughs> and gave him the strawberries. And from that moment on, for the rest of that trip, he was just totally different. Because he got to the causal emotion, right? Now, this is, remember I keep saying all the time, all of us need to be like a child. This is what we'll need to do. But what I'm suggesting is, you, you don't need to throw things at other people in order to get to your causal emotion, right? Now, a child may, but you don't need to do this. What you need to do is go into a space where you can connect with this anger and connect with this rage and connect with this tantrum fully without actually throwing things, punching people, using a knife on somebody, which often people finish up getting to do, right? This is why a lot of people are afraid of dealing with their emotions because there's so many really, really harsh emotions inside of them that, that uh, they feel if they express them, they'll do damage to others. So, my Mary wants to say something as well in a minute. So, um, my suggestion is to allow yourself to understand that each of us in getting to our emotions, we'll probably have to do that process, right? And stepping down into the emotions. Now, you will notice the difference when you get to the causal emotion. The causal emotions are often very short to deal with. And even in a relationship, they're often very short compared to the long levels of denial that we have. So you can deny an emotion for a year or two years and be in a rage, and then in a week, the whole thing's gone. It just depends on how much you want to suppress all of the stuff that's there inside of you. I was just going to say, I can feel everyone feeling uh, quite resistive to talking about their partnerships yeah. and their relationship, so I thought maybe I'd be vulnerable. Okay, you want to come up and do that? You'll need to bring the mic with you. For those of you who don't know, this is Mary, my partner. Hello. A gorgeous girl. <laughs> I, I wanted to share with everyone that I feel like I've been like Luca, the little <laughs> three-year-old, except my tantrums lasted about uh, 18 months <laughs> <laughs> with my partner. And um, it's only been in the past month, I think, that I'm really starting to connect with a lot of, um, a lot of issues causally that have caused a lot of problems in our relationship. Mm. Yep. I've dealt with some other emotions along the way, but um, my issues around men and my issues around my soulmate, I've been very resistive to, and I understand that it's because they're so big. Um, mm. yeah. so, so one of the reasons why we resist causal emotions with our partners is because usually the emotions that are related to the relationship are also the emotions that are deep within us of hurt and grief related to in, in most of our cases, our relationships with either our mother or our father. Right? And all we're doing in most of our relationship issues is just acting out our denial of the emotions that we need to connect with with regard to the opposite gender. Yeah. Maybe if I just talk a little bit about what's happened for me emotionally in our relationship. Yep. Um, uh, you can jump in if I miss anything. <laughs> Um, I have... With the baseball bat or...? <laughs> no. Jumping with the baseball bat. <laughs> Mary broke our baseball bat. No, that was mine. Oh, no, that was mine. Sorry, sorry about that. 
<laughs> Mike and I have been We having... need to know to buy another baseball bat. <laughs> Get an aluminium one, yeah. That's the thing. So if you, you're buying baseball bats for anger management, aluminium baseball bats. <laughs> Wooden ones, after, after a while they break. They're going back. Um, I, my pattern with men has been to actually be quite controlling, but not in an overt kind of bossy way, more in an emotional way. Um, uh, if you don't do what I want, then I kind of get into this suppressed anger with the man. Or if you don't, um, if you do something that makes me feel afraid, uh, for example, a lot of the stuff that AJ talks about, about our first century life, for me that's invoked a lot of fear. Um, and whenever I feel that people might ridicule us or get angry at us, or even at AJ, my tendency was to project a lot of anger, very quietly I thought but he can feel it <laughs> um, to make because I wanted him to stop because I didn't want to feel my fear and I had a very big realization in the last week about just how controlling I have been towards AJ um, because of my fear of just simply feeling my own emotions mm. um, but I didn't get to that place until a few other things happened I, um, I've also had got this really deep need in the relationship for everything to be rosy. I just want us all to feel happy and nice and, <laughs> um, and of course when you're triggering a lot of uh, emotions and living with someone who's in truth all the time, that's hard. <laughs> and I kept wanting to skip over things or I'd get triggered, I'd get angry and even though I'm on the divine love path and I know I've got to feel my emotions and I'd feel some emotions, I realised that I'd skipped over a great deal of that causal anger that AJ was talking about and that um, it wasn't until um, really the last month when I said instead of trying to cling to the relationship and make everything okay in the relationship, I went, well, come what may, and this relationship may not work, but I've got to go and feel rage and I've got to feel, maybe I don't love AJ and I've got to feel all of these things that were still within me because I hadn't just let myself sit in that emotion and process it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So does everyone understand what Mary's getting at? Like, so, so for 18 months... Well, the feeling that I've had from Mary for 18 months was this feeling of deep rage and anger with me because of the choices that I made in the first century. So Mary's had this big, like, rage about that. So any time I speak about, say, a big picture thing or a bit to speak about my identity or speak about um, our life in the first century or speak about any of those kind of things, her first response was anger towards myself. It was to protect the feeling of fear within herself. Does that make sense? So that's what she was protecting. And a lot of times I didn't know why I was angry or I, I invented a, a higher, you know, a more capping level to be angry. But really the causal thing was I don't want to feel what I'm feeling so I'll just get angry at you. Yeah. Now when, when that happens I just feel it. Whenever anybody's angry, even if you don't express it towards me, I feel it as a barrage of like hatred, basically. Um, so I'm very, very sensitive to it. So I will say to Mary, you're angry, right? No, I'm not. <laughs> and so we'd go through this process, right, of no, I'm not. Yes, you're definitely angry. And I can even tell you what it's about if you want. And, but because of the fear of dealing with it, there's a whole lot of denial that needs to be gotten through first. Yeah. And, and often then maybe I'd connect with being a little bit angry and then I'd quickly suppress it and then I'd say, I'm so sorry because I know anger's not loving. I'm so sorry I was angry at you and I'd feel like I was really, truly sorry because it's awful that AD has to cop my anger. And I'd say, no, you're not. <laughs> well, yes, I am. <laughs> and I'd say, no, you're not. <laughs> and then we'd go on. And I'd get angry again. Hmm. And now, can I just illustrate it? We'll illustrate this later as to the issues of repentance and forgiveness, right? And we'll talk about this later in our discussion. Um, so Mary will come up a few times during our discussion and we'll talk about these issues. But one thing I wanted to point out is that if you do something, the same kind of thing again to your partner, then you were not sorry the first time you did it. Now, when, you, when I use the word sorry, I don't mean, you know, like we have, you know, we tell our child, you know, oh, you hit that little boy, did you? 
say sorry, say sorry, you know, like, not like that. Because all that does is tell the child to say it's sorry, it doesn't mean anything to the child, does it? The child doesn't feel sorry, feels like totally justified, <laughs> you know, for kicking the child, other child or whatever. Right? It, what we need to do is get to a feeling of sorrow, and underneath the feeling of sorrow is a causal emotion. And we need to release that causal emotion that created the event. And that's the only way that we're really repentant or sorry. Up until then, you'll be able to repeat it over and over again. Now, we'll talk more in detail about this later, but that's what happens. So, so when Mary was saying to me, sorry for being angry, I'm saying to Mary in return, well, no, you've been angry with me now five times this week. So you're not sorry. There's a causal emotion in here that needs to be dealt with. And can I say at that point, because I agree that that's a truth, if I'm still getting angry, yep, I'm not sorry, that's when the good old emotions of self-deception really kick in. Because instead of then going into really feeling, okay, I have a rage here that I need to connect to, I would go to, I am a horrible person. I keep getting angry at this man who's just loving me. What am I doing? And that's... that's the key, that's when I learned a lot about emotions of self-deception. Um, that pain, the pain of beating myself up, was preferable to feeling the pain that I've just started to feel. Mm -hmm. And I can understand why, because it's quite dark, the stuff that I started to feel. Mm -hmm. So often we have this layer of very, very dark emotion. We have this layer of very, very dark emotion. And then we have this layer of preferable emotion. The preferable emotion is like even getting down to punishing yourself is often a preferable thing to feeling the deep, deep hurt that you feel from your childhood, like not being loved by your dad or your mum, or in Mary's case, not being loved by her soulmate, is a very, very deep, dark emotion and a feeling that she has very strong. And so capping that is better for Mary to punish herself because that is easier to cope with than actually feeling that terrible feeling that's underneath that. Does that make sense? And it's a completely manufactured feeling. God doesn't punish me. Um, AJ's not punishing me. There's no need for me to punish myself except for this emotion that I have. I've done something wrong, so I should be punished. Um, but I'm cr actually creating that emotion. Mm. Yeah. So what we want to do today is, uh, is actually go step by step through the different types of things that can happen to you when you're dealing with emotions in a, in a relationship and, and what kind of, we'll give some illustrations of this, and what kind of things you can actually do with regard to firstly taking emotional responsibility, secondly in terms of actually feeling the truth in the relationship and taking uh, and feeling and dealing with your emotions and then with the issues of forgiveness and repentance in the relationship. Because sometimes I might do something that harms Mary that, that you know, Mary feels really hurt by. And then I've, there's obviously things I need to feel about that if, for this relationship to remain intact. Because if I don't feel about them, what's going to end up happening is Mary, Mary's going to have this great big long list of all the hurtful things that I've done. And eventually that great big long list of all the hurtful things is going to be so long that she won't be able to emotionally, if she doesn't release those emotions, she will not be able to emotionally connect with me anymore. And you know what will happen then? The instant that happens, we haven't got a relationship. Does that make sense? Even if we're living together, we still don't have a relationship in that state. Now, um, someone, just, uh, just wait for the microphone. Let's... Thanks, Michael. I'm not sure if this is getting a little bit ahead, but hello, I'm Alicia. <laughs> um, I just was wondering, when you're saying go into that emotion, what you're feeling, um, before you said, Mary, go into, hang on, uh, go into the sorrow yourself. I'm just wondering, um, if you want to go into the sorrow, would you say that connecting to God's love would be the way that that happens the most? Or how do you connect to that sorrow if you're going through all these emotions and you're being a certain way to your partner, but you want to feel it, get into it to be able to release it? How do you get into it? Well, I, rem I removed myself from AJ. Yeah. And I acknowledged that I was really angry. And instead of... Um, before then, I was really projecting a lot of my anger at him. Um, but I got out the baseball bat or the tennis racket or whatever was around and I really let myself just be angry 
and feel about the emotion, like the feeling of injustice or, or whatever was there. And then I very quickly dropped into the grief that I had about that. So by releasing it, go, like you were saying about the child with the tantrum, go through it, just keep going yep. through it and you'll break through, through it. to it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, like, I had to let myself be really loud and really snotty. But not not and at me. She wasn't yeah. doing it at me yeah. anymore. Yeah. I so acknowledge that it was my emotion. Yeah. Instead yeah. of yelling at me or denying that it's actually there, Mary takes the action of just going outside with a baseball bat. We've got quite a few things that you can hit outside, right? And make a bit of a racket. And then, and Mary's like really good at processing emotion so so when she when she starts allowing the connection to emotion she was then she was then yelling and screaming and going to baseball back we live on a 40 acre property so it's, so can i so come out sometime and borrow your baseball bat <laughs> anybody can come out if you come out for the point of view of borrowing our baseball bat and going for anger anybody's welcome to do that um, a lot of times people come out and say they want to do that and then they don't do that and then we send you home <laughs> but the um, the, the key is that it, how it looks like was right, 15 minutes of just going for it, isn't it? Like, and, 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 and yelling and even maybe swearing about me, like, you know, like... Or it ended up actually being about beliefs I had about myself, you know. Yeah. Um, but you don't know that when you begin this. Yeah. What that's I about. just went with whatever word was there, whatever, yep. And at the same time, I... I do long to God, but my long it's more asking, help me get this out, like please help me stay in this God, I just want this out of my soul, can you just help me stay there? Um, because really it is these emotions that are blocking God's love. So, you know, I can long for God's love, and I do, um, but a, a lot of times I'm not receiving it because there's all this stuff here that I'm, you know, in denial about. Mm. So it's only when we kind of can get it moving yeah. yeah so does that make sense it's like yeah, when the beauty of going through the anger rather than remember i did a talk some time ago about anger being your guide so you could think of anger as a person you imagine a person who's got you by the hand and leading you down a path now the beauty of anger if you think of it like a person is that anger is this person leading you down the path into the causal emotion don't be angry with the people around you go and actually be angry and own the anger itself inside of you and express and experience that anger inside of yourself and express it and and it's sort of like um i was saying to mike this week mike, mike and i were having a conversation we were out weeding some mother of millions and and, and as we often do just to trigger some emotions and um and Mike was starting to express some of, uh, some of the anger that he felt in the relationship, but he was talking the story of it, right? Now I said, Mike, you all got right, anger right now. Grab the baseball bat or whatever and now go and express it. So Mike goes down away from us, because that's one of his emotions to do with, about being away from people expressing it, and starts beating a drum with the baseball bat, right? But the problem is, he's still not expressing it. He's still... So I go down there <laughs> and he thinks he's going to get told off but all I said was start saying what you feel as you're beating the drum. Does that make sense? As you're making the racket, start being a racket as well. Start really feeling that emotion. Now when you started doing that, that's when you started connecting very rapidly, wasn't it, to some grief. And it's the same goes with Mary. Mary gets through the anger very rapidly when she does that and into the grief and for me when she's experiencing that anger in that way even though it might be still towards me it feels totally different to me because the reason why is it's not a barrage of emotion coming at me it's actually an emotion she's owning within herself and so when I get angry it's the same if I'm owning if I'm not owning my anger I'll barrage it at Mary does that make sense but if I'm owning my anger, I'll actually go outside, beat, you know, the bat or whatever, and connect to what's inside of me and experience that emotion. And usually when you do that, it's very rare for you to stay very angry for very long. Right? And then what you might, it might happen is you might stop processing the emotion, and, and then you realise, oh, there's a bit of extra anger here. So you experience, express the anger a bit more and away you go with the emotion again and then express the anger a bit, just like a child would through a tantrum, right? Basically, it's the same process. 
and then you get to the causal emotion and release that. When you release the causal emotion, it's very different afterwards. You feel very different afterwards. And usually that's the time when you feel a sense of peace. And also it's the time when you can usually feel a trickle of God's love coming to you if you long for it. Does that make sense? After that time. This is, I don't know if this is the right place to say it right now, but if you have an issue with God as such being an entity, how do you accept that? How do you learn to work through all that? Well, that is one of the emotions you will need to work through to actually receive divine love. So talk, as if you were talking to anybody, talk to God about whether they are an entity or not an entity and test it out and see what happens when you believe they are an entity and see what happens when you believe they are not an entity and test that relationship out with God in the same way as you would anybody else. What happens though is that on the divine love path you may begin not thinking that God is an entity but every single person who's progressed on the divine love path eventually finishes up feeling God as an entity. Not that they believe it and a lot of times they don't even intellectually understand how that can be but they have a deep feeling that God is an entity after they've processed different groups of emotions. Yeah. Um, um, Dennis had some questions. I uh, don't know if you've still got some questions after all that, Dennis. But Hey, Jake. The hurt that you said that Mary was stacking up and you have to feel that, how can you distinguish whether it's just coming through Mary's filters and it might not be hurt in, in that way? Do you, do you get my meaning? Um, do you mean like um, if Mary's feeling hurt by something I've said, yep. um, how, do, how, does, how, do, how does Mary know that it's not because I'm being nasty? Or how do you know? Or how do I yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's a good question. Do know? How do you know? Well. If you feel hurt, you've got to feel hurt because there's an emotion there. It, whether or not, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. If, if it's triggering something in you, obviously you have to stay true to the emotional experience. So feel whatever's triggered within yourself. So feel hurt. Right. Doesn't but, matter what the cause is. But so why have, so when you're hurt, how does AJ actually know it is a hurt? If he, if he doesn't feel he's done the wrong, well, I can describe that to you at the moment, Dennis, but the problem with describing it to you at the moment is that you've got to be emotionally sensitive to know the difference, and that means working through the so whole... So you'd feel it? Well, yeah. What, what happens is I feel totally different. When Mary can be yelling at me about a causal emotion, and I have no emotional response from it because she's actually owning her emotion as she's doing it if that makes sense. The, the anger is passing through her as she's doing it in that instance. The only time I feel any like thing coming from Mary is if Mary either one does not own the anger, in other words projects den the denial of the anger at me, then I feel the anger in its full effect. Or if Mary's yelling at me but actually it's, she's intending to harm me because she feels blaming of me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Rather than just feeling the emotion of anger within herself. There's a big difference between those two states. But in a relationship, if we're in a very similar condition, you won't know the difference. And so what you will need to do then is own your own emotion about what's coming at you. Now, if you own it completely, you will not be in a rage back with the other person. Right? But if you don't own it completely, you will get into a rage with the other person. Guaranteed. Right. Okay, so whenever you're in a rage with the other person, understand, and I'm projecting it at the person, understand you are not owning an emotion and you're doing it because you are afraid of connecting with a deeper causal emotional experience inside of yourself. That's why you're doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. You need a boxing ring with a screen. <laughs> Sorry? You need a boxing ring with a screen. Basically, yeah. Like, allow yourself to remove yourself from the situation and feel the emotional response that you have. Now, sometimes in a relationship I notice that people don't let their partner remove themselves. No, they follow you around. They follow you around. And feel that. It's very oppressive. If, and by the way, if you're one of the people doing that, following your partner around, yelling at them while they're trying to cry, for example, if you're doing that, you are very much out of harmony with love, obviously, in that state. 
and you've got some major emotional issues of projection and blame and, and anger and rage to work through if you do that. You should allow each other to remove each other, yourself from the situation at any time and own the emotion. Right? Own the emotion. So feel and experience the rage. In the case of a person who's following me around, I will actually just sit in one place and cry, right? And if they still don't leave me in that state, then after I've finished crying, I'll get up and I'll say, I'm never going to speak, I'm never going to be with you again. And I go. Now, now in a relationship, that would mean leaving your whole life, right? And, and I've, I've done that myself in the past if a person has been in that situation. It took me a lot of years to learn that, that you don't have to stay in a place where somebody is just bombarding you, bombarding you, bombarding you, bombarding you, and bombarding you with stuff. Right? We'll talk about that with regard to repentance and forgiveness in a minute when we go through those topics. Right? So understand that you can feel your emotion even when somebody is chasing you around, yelling and screaming at you while you're crying. It's pretty intense. And you can do that. And down here and then Jen up the back, thanks. I thought there was an interesting question, AJ, my name's Mary. Because yep. I went through something like this in the week, during the week, and um, this whole notion of is it me, is it something he's doing, or is this my stuff? And I went through all this stuff, you know, I'm so angry at him, blah, 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 and I thought, no, I went through all the emotional crying and yelling and screaming, whatever, yep. for several days. But then at the end of that, and it, and it did go back to feeling abandoned as a child and my father was never there and he's never there for me. Yep. And then suddenly I found myself um, multiplying the hours in the day and the week and I'm thinking, how many hours a week is he spending with me? <laughs> we really got quite bizarre. Okay, no, that's good I though. Thought, that's good. He's actually not spending enough time with me, but because I've cleared all that emotion, but in the meantime, I'd send a few texts and got him completely confused. Then I rang him and he real and I told him what I'd been going through, and he was quite accepting. He's all, you know, I, I actually haven't been making enough time for you. Exactly. Well, what a breakthrough. Exactly, and that's a very good indication that you've dealt with the causal emotion. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. When your partner actually has these realizations that, wow, yes, actually, you see, oftentimes we feel abandoned because we are actually abandoned, <laughs> you know, but the. In the relationship, right now. But we've been triggered so much. Yeah, you need to hold it a bit closer. The, you need to hold the mic closer. Oh, sorry. Otherwise we can't hear you. Because to me that's the basic, that we have not been loved enough as little children. Yes. And we have been abandoned. Yes. And over here I was with this father who never had time for me, even though he was working at home. Yep. Workaholic. Yep. And now I've got a man in my life who's a workaholic. <laughs> yep, exactly. Good law yeah. attraction. And yep. you know... It was quite amazing. But yes. it was interesting because I haven't watched your stuff. I'm really quite a cynic. I'm an investigative journalist, to yeah. tell you the truth. Yeah. But I had watched your tape just before yeah. and I was just on the verge of rigging them up and dumping all this stuff and I saw your tape and because I, uh, I have done emotional release work and I know how powerful it is and I thought, yeah. okay Mary, go down in there. Well, there you go. <laughs> go down in that rabbit hole. Yeah, that's good. What you did, Mary, was really good, and, and the proof of its effectiveness was when you actually now had worked your way through over the days, worked your way through a lot of that causal emotion, when you rang up the par your partner and expressed those emotions to you, instead of him being resistive and feeling like you're attacking him now, he can feel that you're actually now stating a truth, and then he will look at himself, you see. That's a, that's a very good indication that you dealt with causal emotion in that particular instance. Now, if you'd rang up your partner and instead he just dumped a heap of anger back on you, upset it on you, then you know you probably didn't get to the underlying cause of it all, and you need to still go deeper into, into that. And it's a very good way of seeing, your law of attraction is a very good way of seeing that you've either effectively dealt with it or not. And you can easily see that even if there is a truce in the situation, like you aren't having enough time with your partner, you could have just said exactly the same thing you said to him at the end of the week, at the start of the week, and stuck to your guns and you know it's right and he's not spending enough time with you. But if you didn't connect with the fact, this is my law of attraction and I've got an emotion to feel about it, you might not have a relationship anymore. Whereas at the end of the week, because you dealt with the emotion, now you've got a better relationship. He doesn't love me. There's 168 hours in the week and how many hours? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, can you hold it close? Because it's very good to hear your comments. You were saying, can you hold it, the mic oh, close? So everyone yeah, can hear. I was thinking, um, you know, he doesn't love me and I'm going to break up with him and there's 168 hours in the week. <laughs> It was really quite bizarre yeah. what I went through. And this is the kind of thing you go through in that state, and it's okay to go yeah. through that, to actually go through all the realisations of truth about it. Wow, yeah, out of 168, whatever, 192 hours of, I think it is. Anyway, whatever it is, there's like, um, you know, he spends five with me. Like, whoa, like, how valuable am I? <laughs> and that's a big realisation. I sent him a text, and I thought, oh, my God, I should have done that. <laughs> But, um, yeah, so that was very really great. It was very powerful to do that. Mm. And, it's, and, and a good indication that you dealt with some causal emotion is his response after you went mm. through the process. But you can see also, as you pointed out, any time during it, you could choose to actually project a lot of this rage and anger back mm. on him, which actually creates a lot of confusion and other emotions in the, in the, in the person on the other end as well, obviously. Oh, sure. Yeah. It destroys relationships. Yeah. So what you did was really, really good. Yeah. In, in our relationship, I've had the opposite, where I um, have had all these feelings about AJ, like, he doesn't love me, he's going to abandon me, I'm not important in his life, when actually in our life, I can, my mind can see he's actually treating me in exactly the reverse way, and that's where I got really caught for a long time. I wasn't letting myself just feel the feelings that were there, and as soon as I started to do that, then I could feel the truth of what's happening in our relationship. Yeah. So, so, that's, that's so, like, for me, Mary is the most important person in my life. And I treat her like she is the most important person in my life in terms of the time I want to spend with her. And anybody even who comes out to stay with us knows how much time we spend together, even when we've got visitors and so forth. But, but because Mary had a feeling inside of her that I didn't love her from our first century experience, because of that feeling, she believed that I didn't love her even though there were all, there are all these different things, and it's only when you feel the emotion that you can see the truth. And and I, um, to be honest, I've seen that in a lot of the other women here who are carrying wounds with their dads from childhood. How they project that onto the partner that they're with, who's actually treating them in oh, from the outside you can see quite a respectful way, but because there's all this stuff about men. Um, Often we end up punishing the nice ones because um, we're just bringing that to the relationship mm. and projecting it onto the man. Because a nice fella won't punch you back, whereas the you know the crappy man he'll punch you back. You know what I mean? And so a lot of times what we finish up doing is projecting our beliefs on people who will accept them because they won't return them back to us. You see, a, a man who's abusive. If you're with a man who's abusive, if you yell and scream at him, he's going to punch you in the face. Right? You always use the really extreme example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've got to go for the extremes. Right? But if you're with a man who's nice and kind and considerate, he's never going to punch you in the face, no matter what you do to him, is he? So often we get away with doing a lot more to him than what should be allowed, or what we even should allow ourselves to do. And this is something, women, we see this with men with women as well a lot, you know. A lot of women are so used to being the caretaking provider at home, you know, the cooker, the cleaner, you know, and all these types of things, that a lot of men have come to just treat that as if it's nothing, right? No, have no value of it at all. But the reality is, like, that he needs to learn how to cook for himself and clean for himself, and not only that, he needs to learn how to cook for his partner and clean for his partner as much as she does it for him, really, in the end if they're going to have a relationship that actually has a large degree of happiness in it. So even with the things that we choose to do, often what we're choosing is to hurt the person who absorbs that hurt. You know, we often give more hurt to the people who absorb the hurt than we do to the people who reject it. And it's a bad habit that we've gotten into in our relationships often to do that. So if you find yourself absorbing hurt, or you find yourself giving a lot of hurt, like in the relationship, have a good look at what's going on inside of yourself emotionally, what's happening with that. Now, Jen, thanks. Um, I had a session with Millie and allowed myself to connect to 
um, murderous feelings and I carved up a box and I went into such deep rage that I hated myself, I hated how ugly it was. Yeah. Um, my law of attraction changed in my circle so I know I got through some of it. Yeah. But the ramifications of feeling so ugly and self recrimination for accepting the fact that I triggered this emotion of um, childhood, from childhood, murderous feelings towards men, yeah. it sent me into confusion and d profound dislike of myself because I was so ugly. Yeah. It was so ugly. I was ugly carving up the box. And my question is, I'm in a state of confusion. It's it, it like compounded things rather than the intention was to release. How do you think God feels about you carving up the box, Jen? Um, I know in my head he, she loves me, but I don't love me for feeling murderous feelings towards men, my parents, people around me. Yep. And I, I have connected to this self-hate as a result and it seems to have compounded things, not made it easier. And how would you feel about me if I told you the story about carving up the box? I'd, show, I'd be respectful, I think. I don't know. I think you'd have compassion for me, knowing well, you. I know I love you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and I can would you love you no matter what you did. Yeah. So can you see um, AJ's question about what does God's love do is really important in this situation? There's an issue around forgiveness of yourself. I suppose. You see, what, what's happening is that we often have thoughts and even, you, you imagine if you were a murderer, in fact, imagine that. Well, like, I have been. Yeah, so imagine that, right? And, uh, and we'll often have some very, very terrible thoughts about ourselves doing it, right? We need to feel those thoughts, feel those feelings. Those feelings that we were, you know, of how bad that was inside of ourselves. But then what we need to do is talk to God about, you know, ask God to forgive us for what we felt. Does that make sense? In other words, plead to God for forgiveness of our own behaviour, what we chose to do. But in particular, focus on getting at the cause of why we felt the way we feel. Now, if we don't get to the cause, you will finish up punishing yourself over and over and over and over for the effect. So, so if I've had murderous thoughts and I don't allow myself to get to the cause because I'm judging myself, which is what you're currently doing, if I don't allow myself to get to the cause of my murderous thoughts and feelings, then I'm going to continue to punish myself for my murderous thoughts and feelings. All right? The key is to, to, we can stop this whole cycle by stopping punishing ourselves for our murderous thoughts or feelings in this case and actually start praying to God about what's the underlying reason why I have them. Why do I have them? And let, me, let myself feel the emotion that creates them. Do, do you see the difference? There's a difference between the emotion that creates a feeling so, for, for example, I want to, the feeling is I want to murder people. Obviously, I must have some very, very deep emotions under this murderous feeling that would cause me to, go, to feel so much anger that I feel like I want to murder somebody. Does that make sense? So, obviously, there's quite a lot of anger and rage there that would create me to get to into that state of feeling murderous but uh, uh, over the top or underneath we're going down now there must be huge amounts of grief mustn't there to actually create that amount of anger and rage and so 
In between these two things is one issue and that is when you blame yourself for your terrible murderous feelings and thoughts you are actually not allowing yourself to see that you're just afraid of dealing with that grief that creates them. Does that make sense? It's Can like I when I feel the grief, it's never ever going to stop. That yeah. there are endless causes yeah. for the grief and sadness. It's yeah. like it's it's but, every, but every but remember, Jen, in every cell. With God, all that needs to happen is you need to be willing to go there, and God will help you do the rest. At okay. the moment, you're resisting going there. And what you're doing instead is living in the fear. And then what you do is you go into self-judgment. You judge well, yourself. right? And when you're in this judgment of self, you're just punishing yourself over and over and over again. It's is, actually an emotion of self-deception, Jen. Yeah. And I can relate to exactly what you... Like the, the feeling of the deep fear of the grief that's inside of me and then creating a, a judgment of myself in order to just get away from the fact that I'm terrified about feeling the grief that feels like it'll never end. I was just so ugly carving up the box with a carving knife. Yeah, can I... Now, ugly. Yeah. now you're judging. Yeah. This, I, no one was there looking at me, no, but no, when you're I judging looked yourself. at myself... You're judging yourself. I was ugly. Yeah, but, but that's bec you're only doing that because you're afraid of feeling the grief that's under that anger, right? So, so talk to God about the fear that you have of feeling this never-ending grief. That's what, that's the next okay. step. Thank but you. Talk to God about that. When you talk to God about that, you will start to feel the courage to actually feel some of that and that's when God can help you take a fair bit of it off you as you have the courage to feel some of it. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Yep. And Joy, thanks. Thanks, AJ. Um, you talked before about uh, how we rationalise and reframe to avoid emotions. Yep. I'm an expert. Yeah. Um, and I get into that nice, calm state, and I just realised that this week, actually, when I was looking at my emotions, and I've learnt to live there, and I thought it was peace. Yes. And, um, and so when this was happening at 3 o'clock in the morning last night, I'm like, I couldn't find a way... I couldn't find a way through it. In fact, I, I almost went to sleep and I thought that's, I'm so habituated to it that I can just live there, go to sleep, live life. So, yeah. I can go through. So the question is how to get out of that cycle. When you're in any cycle of denial, the first step to get out of any cycle of denial is prayer. That's what I feel. So the first thing I start doing is having, talking to God about generating a longing within myself to connect to the deeper emotions. You see, the only reason why I'm not connecting to a deeper emotion is because I don't have a longing to do it. I have a longing to avoid it. Does that make sense? And so I also need to ask, what I do too, is talk to God about why I want to avoid it so much. What am I so afraid of with actually connecting to these deep emotions? What is it that's actually causing me to get out of wanting to be emotional and get into using my mind to zen out all the time. What's inside of me that would cause me to do that? And so I usually focus on two areas. You remember um, in some, one discussion I had many, many months ago, it might even be a year ago now, um, I mentioned the dip, there's, a, there's like the fear pain scale and the desire scale. So here's our desire, if you like, and here's our fear. If our fear is up here and our desire is here on a situation, you will not deal with it emotionally. Does that make sense? Because you're more afraid than you are of wanting to go ahead and deal with it. Now there's only two ways that you can change that state on any issue. One way is to reduce the fear. How do you reduce fear? With, with truth. That's the only way to reduce fear. 
fear, remember, is false expectations appearing real. They're what we believe to be true, but they're not true anymore. Right? The truth is the only thing that can overcome your fear. Now, I don't mean overcoming it intellectually. I mean actually absorbing into your soul emotional truths. Because this, this all happens emotionally. None of this happens intellectually. Understand that. None of this happens intellectually. It all has to happen emotionally. So truth needs to enter me emotionally. Desire needs to grow in me emotionally. Now, if my desire is greater than my fear, what will happen now? I will now deal with a situation. So that then tells me I can grow my desire. I can actually make my desire bigger. I can actually work on developing desire. Right? Besides, so I can work on lessening fear, but I can also work on improving my desire. I can do that too, right? Making my desire larger. So my suggestion is to do both, like pray about both. That's, that's what I do. I, so what I pray about is, right, what are my fears? What am I so afraid of? What, and, I, and I start letting myself experience my fears. And remember, none of this is intellectual. So I don't, don't just think about my fears. I actually experience my fears. Some of you would have noticed today that today I'm a bit shaky. You notice that today? Because I'm, ex I'm allowing the experience of the fears that I've been having over the last few days of big, some big picture stuff that's coming up for me. I allow myself to experience it. And it doesn't matter that a hundred of you are looking at me being shaky. Right? That's okay. To me, that's okay. It might not be to you, but it's okay for me. Right? Allow myself to feel my fear. As I allow myself to feel my fear, my fear is going to drop and my ability to emotionally accept truth is going to grow. So the fear is going to come down when I do that. I'm letting out my fear, like letting it run. I can also, though, grow my desire. Now, how do you grow desire? Now, you think, uh, you know, when you first met your partner, you didn't know your partner, did you? For many of us, most of us, never met our partner before. We met them the first time, right? You know, most of us didn't have the luxury of growing up childhood sweethearts or something, right? So we meet our partner. You don't know them. What causes you to want to get to know them? Well, initially there's got to be some little spark, doesn't there? What you would call a spark of interest. Doesn't that start? Isn't that the start? You have a spark of interest and then what do you do? You find yourself thinking about them a lot, right? And you feel about them a lot. And you start to think, oh, I'm feeling about them quite a lot. <laughs> And they might not even know this is going on, right, at this point. Right? They may not intellectually know it's going on. They certainly probably feel it emotionally, maybe. But they might not intellectually know that you've got these feelings now starting to do it. Now, the more you nurture a feeling that's positive, the more it grows. And it's really important to understand that. This is how you grow desire. So how do I grow desire to deal with my emotion? When I start with none by actually thinking about it, let me, letting myself feel about what it would feel like to be in a positive state, feeling all my emotions, imagining myself to be in a state where I'm always emotional and always connected with my emotions and they're all blissful and allow myself to just feel about all that. Does that make sense? Allow myself to connect with all of that. And as I do, my desire will grow, my fear will lessen and as soon as my desire overcomes my fear, that is the very moment you will feel the emotion about the issue. Whatever that issue is. Now, I've said that before in the past, and Mary's heard that lots of times. And I agreed. It's, good. Oh, it's very logical, isn't it? Right. But can you describe what happened a week or so, or this week? Um, uh, AJ and I were talking, and I'd just been processing, f like for the three or four days before, some really uh, dark emotion related to him and uh, and first century and things like that and I was saying to him there's been a big block between us emotionally for a long time and I felt like I want to be with this man but I'm really quite afraid and um, I was saying to him 
I was talking about our relationship and I was saying, I just feel kind of different and I know I'm still afraid. And, and then it dawned on me that that thing had happened and I felt emotionally what it's like to have the desire greater than the fear. Because until that point, or until a little bit before that point, my fear had been dominating and I, I had a little desire there, but my fear, and it wasn't until I actually processed some of my fear and other resistance that my fear dropped and my desire grew mm. and then I felt like that truth emotionally rather than just knowing it as a concept. So a lot of these things that you're getting presented are concepts intellectually. They're not yet emotions that are within you and they cannot be until you go through that transition into it entering you emotionally. So, so many of us finish up hearing this lo lots of different truths but what happens inside of us is that it enters here but it's not yet entering here. When it enters here, you will have this light bulb thing go off and from that moment, you will no longer be afraid of that particular thing or so afraid that you don't deal with it. Does that make sense? The moment the change occurs between desire and fear. But it will be an emotional place you go to. It won't be an intellectual place. You can't manufacture that place intellectually. You have to deal with it emotionally. The only way to deal with it emotionally is do what Mary did, and that is lessen the fear that suppressed the desire. And when you lessen the fear, the fear gets less than the desire, and now, and if you grow your desire as well, obviously that's going to happen eventually. And as soon as that, you could say it's like a balancing act going on inside of you emotionally. Here it starts, fear is up here, desire is here. As you're working on both, working on both, working on both, and you know what happens when you put an extra, just a tiny little weight on this side? What happens? Once it's in equilibrium and you just put a tiny weight on this side of a balancing scale, it just goes bang, doesn't it? To the bottom. And that's exactly what happens inside of you emotionally. You go bang and switch and bang, and all of a sudden you're in a set of emotions that you were so afraid of feeling before, but now you can feel them quite readily. And many of us are going through that transitional process. I've also had that experience with actually processing emotion as well. Mm. Feeling so afraid, it's not going to end, I can't do it, I can't, and living in the fear, but having the desire, and then suddenly reaching a place where uh, it was an overwhelmingly joyous place to emotionally feel this really works, and I just, I want to go for the emotions. I, I just want to go for feeling everything. Yep. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So allow yourself to go through these things emotionally. If you don't allow them emotionally, you will not be able to intellectually do these things. So everything that we've been talking about, you won't be able to intellectually do them. You will think that you will be able to, but you won't. And the key is to get into it from an emotional perspective. So what I'd like to do now is just summarise, firstly, what we want to cover in terms of dealing with our emotions in our relationship. I'll pick up all my papers that I've left all over the place here. So far it looks like we're the only two who've got issues in our relationship. Yeah, no, that's right. The audience is all fine with their relationships. That's why they're here today, isn't it? Like... <laughs> all right. The first thing, and many of you are afraid of exposure. Can I just point that out to you? You're just afraid of exposing your personal life. If you keep going through this, this thing of being f afraid of being exposed, you won't ever get to core emotions within yourself. Right? Allow yourself to be a completely open book. It's okay. Right? If you're judged, well, work through the judgment. Like, don't you think there's been lots of judgment aimed at me over the last five years when, since I've been saying who I am? Of course. Work through it emotionally. Work through the feelings. Do you know what I mean? People are going to judge you. Work through the feelings. Right. Joy, thanks. Um, can we just mic? It's a mic with the mic. Um, I will be vulnerable. I, I f in my relationship, I feel controlled. Um, and so it's not about that behaviour, it's about my... What you're doing is good. You said, I feel, I feel, and this is a feeling. It doesn't mean it's actually happening. It's a feeling you're actually feeling, mm. controlled. Yeah? Mm. 
and um, and that. But what I've always done is gone from that to the intellectualisation and reframed it and rationalised it and just yep. gone to that nice calm place. So, just so, so when just you reframe it, what do you tell yourself? What are the kinds of things you tell yourself when you reframe it? Um, the kinds of things I'll say is that he's doing the best he can. Um, it's my growth. Um, it's my path. Um, what else do I tell myself? Or well, sometimes I tell myself I can't stand this any longer and I'm going. Right, okay. So you, be, so get, a bit more, you get a bit more truthful there, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but what are these reframe, other reframing things? Yeah, most, most of the reframes are knowing that he's under a lot of pressure and he's under a lot of stress and, and knowing that uh, really he's just projecting his fears because um, I do know that. So the truth is I know that he lives in a lot of fear and he projects a lot of, and because of that projects a lot of frustration and a lot of fear at me. Yeah. Now all this reframing, as you know, mm. does nothing for you, mm. aside from putting yourself into a temporary calm state. Mm. The reason why it does nothing to it for you because it doesn't change your law of attraction, mm. so it's not going to change your life, and also it doesn't change the emotion in you, which is, I feel controlled, and um, that's still going to remain in you, and all that you do is if you leave that relationship where you feel controlled, you're just going to attract another relationship where you feel controlled because that emotion is not dealt with. Obviously. Which is why I've been married three times. Exactly, exactly. So, and in each one did they control you? Or did I feel controlled? Did you feel controlled? <laughs> pretty much all pretty my much. life. Okay. So you felt controlled pretty much all your life when you look back at your life, eh? So you can see that. So, so when we do this reframing, this intellectual gymnastics I call it, that most people do, we are actually avoiding even going into the spa space of being truthful about our own denial. The truth is, while I'm doing that, I am actually denying my own emotional state. I'm denying myself. If I'm denying myself, I'm being unloving to myself. I'm not, if I'm not allowing my feelings, I'm being unloving to myself. So I need to get beyond that. But this is a real habitual thing, as you know. This is like the, the cigarette we take to calm everything down. I managed to give them up. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> but so you understand it's just the same action. It's just the cigarette we're having so that we can avoid the emotion of feeling controlled. So what do we do instead? The simplest thing to do is say, we're at the beginning, the simplest thing, we don't want to, we want to stop all this reframing. He's this, she's that, he did this. I understand him now, you know, you know, all this stuff. Well, just forget all that. To be frank with you, it's a waste of your time. It wastes your time. You'd be better off sleeping rather than doing that, <laughs> if you can sleep. Instead, you'd be better off looking at, I feel controlled, I know I'm controlled in my relationship. How does this feel within me? Do I want to actually get to the underlying emotion? You, the answer is no, you don't. Does that make sense? If you're not feeling an underlying emotion right at this moment, it means right at this moment you don't want to feel it. Because the truth is, the moment you choose to feel it, and the moment that you feel like a feeling that you want to feel it, will be the moment you really feel it. Right? So before that point, really, we're just avoiding. So I'm allowed to do this. I am allowed to avoid feeling controlled. And controlled might be, you know, you might have all sorts of different emotions you might put in the place of the word controlled. Right? The truth is you have free will. You're allowed to avoid everything in your life if you want. That's your call. You're not going to be very happy doing it, right? And your law of attraction is going to be a bummer, right? You know, you're going to get it triggered one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other. And that's what's going to happen. That's the truth too. But you're allowed to do that. And so I then say, I, I go the next step. I am afraid of being controlled.
or feeling being controlled. So the first level of resistance that we always generally have to any emotion is our fear of it. When you are afraid of it, you will not feel it. So first, be honest with yourself. I'm allowed to not feel it, and I'm afraid to feel it. And, I, and you know when I say that to people, most people say back to me, no, I'm not. <laughs> and I say, well, while you think that, you are never going to get deeper. And that's really the end of our conversation, because there's nothing more I can say. Because if you are not feeling the emotion right now, there's only one reason why you're not feeling it, and it's because you're afraid of it. And that's been really empowering for me. Even sometimes when I'm stuck at the surface and I know what the causal emotion is inside of me that I don't want to feel, and I'm trying to get to the causal, whereas it's much more empowering to say, oh, I obviously don't want to get to the causal, and then I go, why? And then I can process the block to actually getting to the causal, which is a fear, usually. So the fear is a powerful thing. And the next step I do, because I involve God in all my processes, is I talk to God about my fear. How afraid I am. I admit to my fear. Talk to God about my fear. I don't need to talk to anyone else, to be frank. All I need to ever do with all of my emotions is talk to God about them. Right? God's a great listener. God never rejects me. God never tries to shut me down. She always stays open to how I'm feeling. And she never judges me. And to be frank, I get that from people all the time. So talking to people about my emotions is pretty pointless in most cases. Right? It's far better to talk to somebody who's going to listen. So talk to God about your fear. Talk to God about how you feel inside. Be honest about your feelings. Ironically, when you feel, you'll get them to the state where I am allowed to feel my my fear. Because right? a lot of times what happens to us, we, do, we don't even think that we're allowed to feel our fear, let alone feel it. Right? Because what are you taught about fear? New age path, what are you taught about fear? Well, no, no, oftentimes that's not what we're taught. Like, that's the words that are said. Right? It's not but, spiritual. Yeah, it's not spiritual to be afraid. If you're afraid, then, you know, it's the same as anger, isn't it? If I'm, not, if I'm angry, then I'm not spiritual anymore. And we have all these judgments about fear. Sorry? I, that's right. Yeah, but we need to use the mic. Otherwise, all of what you just said, nobody heard. Yeah. So, so we need to feel our fears and, and allow them to be present right? and actually feel them. Bodily, you will find, you'll get to a point where you bodily feel your fears. You bodily will sh your body will shake and you'll feel all these crazy things that everyone sort of, you know, that everyone else criticises and thinks you should be in a loony bin for, right? And if that's one of your fears, you need to feel that as well. So, so let yourself feel them. And when you get through them, you will actually get to the underlying emotion. When you get to the underlying emotion, then it's very powerful. Usually that's a very short, intense experience, and depending on how intense the emotions are, and afterwards you feel really relieved. And honestly, then often the fear is gone as well. Because you learnt a lot of things in that process, including that you don't need to be afraid of your own emotion. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. So let's look at what we're going to cover after the break. So, because I just want to make it clear what we're going to be going through. The first thing, you'll notice the first subheading, which is on the second page at the top. So what's that? Expression of divine love between partners. So how do we express divine love between partners? And we'll look, at, we'll look at some of the rules about divine love and then how that can be expressed between partners in practical situations. Okay? That's what we'll do then. The next thing, big heading it is. 
I focus on total responsibility for all my personal emotions. Focus on total responsibility. What we're going to do is look at how to do that. You see, on the divine love path, you are responsible for everything you feel. Right? And I don't mean you're responsible for everything that was created in you. I'm saying you're responsible for everything that you are doing right now with your feelings. Because you have the choice to experience them or not. That's your choice. Right? I'm not saying that these emotions didn't get into you by some terrible means. Some of you were abused, some of you were harmed, some of, there's been people in the world who've been attacked and tortured and all sorts of things happened to them, right? Of course they're going to have whole groups of emotions in them. They're not responsible for what those people did. They're only responsible to feel the emotions that are still within them about what those people did. Does that make sense? This is what total responsibility is all about. On the natural love path, we often reason ourselves out of total responsibility. Right? We say things like, yeah, but they did the wrong thing. Or, I'm going to remove myself from them. Right? That's not taking responsibility often for your own law of attraction. So, we'll talk about those kind of principles. What's the next main thing? I focus on emotionally processing all of my errors regarding love. Emo emotion of processing. And what we're going to cover there is we're going to look at, in a, and this is all in relation to a partnership, remember. Right? What we're going to look at there is I am going to focus on emotionally processing my way through what's happening in my partnership. I am not going to intellectually try to resolve my partnership anymore. On the Divine Love Path, remember our intellect is just like a tool. Remember I've called it the dumb, you know, it's just the dumb processor, you know, that responds to the feelings. That's all it does. That's all our intellect's doing. When I emotionally process, and I can use my intellect to, to help me emotionally process, or I can use my intellect to avoid everything. My suggestion is use your intellect like a tool to emotionally process through every single emotion you feel in the relationship. So not do this intellectually. No more intellectual gymnastics in the relationship. No more you know, holding back from truth in the relationship. You know, how many of us told our partner today what we really felt in our relationship? I, I, I did today. Me too. Yeah, right. This is what we need to do. We need to get to this point where I tell Mary everything. Mary tells me everything. What's going on inside of her. She wakes up with a dream, tells me. What the dream, the different emotions. When if I wake up with feelings, I tell her what those feelings are. Even if those feelings are about her, or she has feelings about me. You're going to abandon me, you're going to die, whatever. She just tells me whatever it is. Does that make sense? Total openness emotionally. Focus on the emotion of the truth of the emotion. That's what we'll be discussing in that section. Then? I focus on replicating God's forgiveness of all sin. So focus on forgiveness. Right. Now forgiveness means that if I do something to harm Mary, Mary is in the state where she's not even angry about it. She's not even resentful about it anymore. She's forgiven me completely for it, whatever I just did. It doesn't mean we're going to stay together, by the way. It just means that she's in a state now where there's no emotional harm inside of herself about what I did. Does that make sense? We'll talk about that in detail about what goes on with forgiveness. What's next? I focus on principles of repentance and mercy in the relationship. So repentance, uh, E-N-C-E, A-N-C? Uh, A-N-C. Right? Remember, these are the things God does with you. 
Right? God expects you to take total responsibility for your life and your emotion. God expects you to connect emotionally. I'm, when I say expects, I'm saying if you want a relationship with yourself, the way God designed our entire universe is if you want a relationship with yourself, you're going to have to be emotional. If you want a relationship with a partner, you're going to have to be emotional. And if you want a relationship with God, you're going to have to be emotional. Right? Now, God also says to you, you don't have to have a relationship with me. You don't have to have a relationship with your partner and you don't even have to have a relationship with yourself if that's what you don't want. Right? So God's not telling you, not holding a whip over you saying, you must have a relationship with me. Or must, you know, he's not doing that at all. He's not punishing you. But he has, God's made the laws in such a way that if you don't connect emotionally to these things, you won't enjoy the bliss of them ever. Right? You cannot enjoy a blissful, loving relationship with your partner in your head. You can only do it with your feelings. Does that make sense? You try it in your head sometime. It don't work so good. You know? So but every one of these things is how God treats you. So God treats you with her emotions. She feels things for you. God feels forgiveness for you. Whenever you do anything that breaks one of her laws, you are instantly forgiven by God in the sense that God does not ever...